it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 131 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Phantom Coffee Roasters. Holly and what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today we are brewing their Mexican coffee with its notes of fruit and cocoa. It is so yummy. Mm-hmm. Now, you can also drink the same coffee. Where can they go? Phantomroasters.com. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. So, are you ready to sip some of this absolutely delicious coffee and chat? I am, but first a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 30% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats. Orders $40 and more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code CWTCL30 for 30% off your first purchase. Try it today. So, how are you doing? Pretty well. How about you? Doing pretty good. I'm happy with the weather. It's nice. It's not hot, not cold. It's great right in the middle. It's a really pretty day, yeah. It's a really beautiful day out there. Joe's out there cutting the grass. It's what he does on Fridays. <laughs> As we record, I can hear him. But yeah, I've been working in the garden. I'm really happy with my sage. Man, it's exploding. It's doing great. My sage is huge and it's covered with blooms. Really? Yeah. Mine isn't covered with blooms, but the colors of the sage this year are so deep. Mm -hmm. It's just awesome. I'm really excited about my peonies blooming. That's one of my most favorite times of the year is to watch them and they smell so good. My roses, the roses in my front garden are just in spectacular bloom right now and they smell amazing and you get this beautiful wafting rose scent as you walk to the chicken coops oh yeah and soon it'll be the honeysuckle i love honeysuckle Mm -hmm. smell in the air also we don't have much of that on my place but my family farm loads of honeysuckle we have a lot around here it just you'll walk and you'll just smell it it smells so good good. yeah the chicks are getting big too quick they're so cute (laughs) check out our social media so you can follow them Gigi is quite the personality. Let me tell she you. She really all. is. She's so cute. Okay. So bring up something that we want to share some news with you guys. We are part of what's called the Backyard Chicken Summit. It's going to be in mid-June and it's going to be pretty exciting. So this is a three-day event. It's entirely online. There's a variety of speakers speaking on different topics. Our friend Lisa is going to be there. Lisa Steele. Lisa Steele will be there and several other well-known people in the poultry industry. We'll have links to the event in our show notes. Now, it's free, so you can watch it in real time for free as right. each presentation is given. Right. And then, like, after ours, we'll hang out in the, the Facebook Live chat room for an hour. Yeah, we'll be there to talk for, with everybody. For questions. But if you want to be able to go back and look at all of the videos, you know, have access to them afterwards. And get the toolkit, which gives all the presentations and writing, basically. Right, written. It's a written resource. Then you have to buy a ticket. Yeah. Links for that are in the show notes as well. And if you have any questions, shoot us an email or a message. We'd love to answer. We're so excited to be part of it. Okay. So this also brings us to this thing. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It's another really great way to help the show grow. If you're looking for other ways to help the podcast, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell a chicken-loving friend or two about the podcast. Or 100. You can visit our Etsy shop. Check out the t-shirts and mugs that we have there. You can become a patron of the show. Patreon.com slash Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. A huge welcome to all of our newest patrons. Yes, thank you. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. 
tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tee for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tee. They are so cute and so soft. In the February box, I absolutely love the red iron rooster trivet and the seed block. I really love that egg timer. It's going to be great when I'm baking. And those chicken stickers are going to be awesome on notes I send out. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Time for the Breed Spotlight, yeah. 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 This week's Breed Spotlight, we're doing the Chanticleer. It's a cool chicken. I really like the Chanticleer. I wish there were I wish there were more of them available nearby. Yeah, there it's a really neat chicken. The story of the Chanticleer has its roots in France, though the chickens themselves are Canadian. One of the only chickens. The only chicken. Right. Developed in Canada. But I always to myself think of this chicken as American, but it's because it's North American. Yeah. I think that's because in the APA standard of perfection, it is in the American class. Right. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. But it is Canadian. Now in the late 1800s, so probably like 1880s, maybe up to the 1890s, there was an order of Catholic monks, the Trappist monks. They were expelled from France by the army of the French Third Republic. Wow, and you know I love me some monks. Right. So the monks were adrift. Now, the brothers were offered property in Quebec by another Catholic order, the Sulpicians. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And so several of the Trappist monks took them up on that offer, and they emigrated to Canada. Okay. After a few years on the property, the monks entered into a partnership with the University of Montreal, and they created the Oka Agricultural Institute. Oh, okay. And apparently it was it was famous. The Abbey was well known for this agricultural school and also for the development and sale of two types of cheese, the mm. Oka and the Port Salut. No, nice. I've not heard of the Oka, but I've heard of Port Salut. I have too. Yeah. Nice. Yep. So cheese and chickens, they go che- well together. Right. Can you go uh, <laughs> exactly <laughs> cheese, chickens, and coffee. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point in the early 20th century. Brother Wilfred Chatelaine, who was one of the Trappist monks and a doctor of agronomy. Okay. He came to the realization that there were no Canadian breeds of chickens amongst the Abbey's flocks. And he was correct. There were only American and European breeds. Right, exactly. So he decided to remedy this omission and create a bird that was dual purpose and cold hardy enough to withstand the Canadian winters. Cold hardy is very important for the Canadian side. When I was contemplating graduate school. Did I ever tell you I was considering going to University of Guelph in Canada? Oh, wow. You know what decided me against it? The cold. Yes, because I was looking for apartments and I kept coming across ads for sleigh dogs. (laughs) Or sled dogs, I should say. (laughs) Sled dogs. So that was enough for me. Anyway, what the monks ultimately created was a chicken that was as attractive as it was practical. Right. And that was the Chanticleer. The name, the Chanticleer. It's French. I think it means something like clear song. That's right. what it, it, translates it has a nice to. ring to it. Mm-hmm. What kind of chicken do you have? I have a Chanticleer. Chanticleer. So Brother Wilfred and the monks worked on the Chanticleer for about 10 years. So that was from around 1908 to 1918. These monks have a lot of time and they tend to like to create chicken breeds and well, take the time. I mean, they were in agricultural school. <laughs> they were <laughs> like, what are you going to do? I'm just going to develop a new chicken for Canada. Okay, thank you. 
<laughs> there, were, there were five foundation breeds used in the creation of the Chanticleer. Okay, so let's list these breeds. It's the Dark Cornish. The White Leghorn. The Rhode Island Red Shocker. The White Wyandotte. And the White Plymouth Rock. Now, when you look at them, I believe that you can see a lot of the Wyandotte in them. Oh, yeah, definitely. Again, you know, we have them up on our screen. We're looking at them right now. Yes, you can. The result of the breeding was a large, handsome chicken with a small cushion comb. The cushion comb is essentially flat. It's slightly raised, but it doesn't have any points or protuberances. Well, if you're in Canada, you don't need a big comb. Heck no. <laughs> so that cushion comb, they have tiny waddles and very small red earlobes. Nothing needs to be big up there for cold. I wouldn't think so. <laughs> So both the hen and the roo have these small combs, as well as sturdy, clean yellow legs. Yeah, they're good-sized. A white chicken and a yellow legs always go well together. It's a, it's a very attractive chicken. Okay, so they have the upright tail, which is nice, and they are, it's about the medium size, okay? The, yeah, it's like, it's not dragging the ground, right? but it's not super short. They're kind of medium, p- with a pretty flow to it. Right, and they have flowing sickle feathers also, Yeah, which are nice. If you look at them... They're unusual looking. They look a little different. I have a white one up on the computer screen mm-hmm. now. But oh, the white hen, yeah. There's nothing, I mean, I feel like every white chicken has yellow legs almost. That's true. They usually do. They really do. It's just like a classic white chicken. Our friend Penny always says there's nothing better than a white chicken in the green grass. <laughs> and it is true with their yellow legs. So these birds are medium to heavy birds. Mm-hmm. Now, that's again for cold hardiness yeah. for sure. And the boys, the roos are coming in weighing at about eight and a half pounds and the girls at about six and a half pounds. So they're the medium to large, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, they were intended to be a dual purpose bird. Oh, yeah. About 10 years after the creation of the white Chanticleer, there was an absolutely beautiful partridge Chanticleer Mm -hmm. developed. Which is actually the more iconic one. I think it's gorgeous, but you know how I feel about partridge. Yeah, partridge they had at my heart too. Yeah, they're just beautiful. They used four foundation breeds for the Partridge Chanticleer. They used the Partridge Wyandotte, the Partridge Cochin, a Dark Cornish, and the Rosecomb Brown Leghorn. Huh. That's a nice mix right there. You got to get that Leghorn in there for that egg leg yes. ability, yep. that's for sure. Now, some breeders regard the two colors as individual breeds instead of just color varieties. In the same hmm. way as the Rhode Island Red and the Rhode Island White are different breeds. I, know. I don't see that, though. Well, it's just well, not the way I look at the end of the day, the APA has them as both colors listed under the breed Chanticleer exactly. in the American class. So the white was accepted into the standard of perfection in 1921 and the partridge in 1935. Okay. There's also an unrecognized buff variety that is a very pretty bird. A lot of you were saying before, a lot of people like the buff, mm-hmm. which is nice. I love buff birds. The Chanticleer is currently listed in the watch category of the livestock conservation priority list. And just so you know, there are also bantam Chanticleers. Yay! <laughs> Who doesn't love a bantam, right? Okay, so in general, the Chanticleer, the hens are very good layers of large light brown or pink eggs. Nice. Which is good, about four a week, 180 to 200 per year. And they're good winter layers. They will sometimes go broody. Mm-hmm. So just know these facts. They are a winter bird made to be in Canada. So they're going to be more comfortable in a colder environment. That's yeah. for sure. So once they finish their fall molt, they probably start up laying sooner than other breeds would. Exactly. And they do have a reputation for being very calm and gentle. Hey, another great thing in some of these is chickens. You want a big, calm, gentle chicken. That's right up my alley right That's right up my alley, too. They would be an excellent homestead breed, especially in northern climates. They're not particularly heat-hardy, though. So if you want them for a southern climate, you absolutely have to add fans. You need to make sure they have plenty of shade and cool dirt, etc. All the things you need to do anyway, but... Get the extras in there when you're talking about the heavyweight breeds. Oh, yeah. So they're also going to be a great addition to a backyard laying flock, as well as making really great pets. A gentle, calm chicken. You want that around your kids. They're big. They're easy to carry. They're nice to hug. Absolutely. That's for sure. That's a huggable armful right there. Oh, yeah. They are friendly birds, and they have a reputation for doing well in a mixed flock. Now, this is important. That is a key thing to remember right there, because some birds are going to be great with people and not great in a mixed flock, Mm -hmm. and some birds are going to be, you know, not so great with people, but great in a mixed flock. This bird's got it all. Right. So if you're in a cooler environment, 
this would be one that I would pick. I would be afraid in our mid Atlantic summers. It might be a little too I, warm. Here I gotta for be them. honest with you. I don't think they're that much different than a Jersey Giant or Buff Orpington. I mean, yeah. all the bigger birds that are going to need some heat provisions. They like to scratch and forage, but they do handle confinement fairly well. I think that this bird, I mentioned the Jersey Giant. I could see this bird doing really well with any of the laid back breeds, but especially with some of the more laid back Americans like the Jersey Giants, the Dominiques, the Delawares. Right. I can see this bird doing really well with the Delaware. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. And they would be great with pictures together. Be like they're beautiful. twinsies. <laughs> they would be. They'd be beautiful. <laughs> Okay, so here's the thing. They can be hard to find. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where can we find this bird? Check the Livestock Conservancy's Breeders Directory for stock that may be local to you. The Chanticleer Fanciers International Club also has a Breeders Directory on their website. We'll have that linked in the show notes. And some of the larger commercial hatcheries do sell them as day-old chicks. It's going to be like a little treasure hunt trying to mm -hmm. find this one. So yeah. you're going to have to really search in if you really want this bird. But this is one that's worth it. I think the the white is lovely, but I'd be all about that partridge. Oh, yeah. The partridge. I always love a partridge bird, mm -hmm. for sure. So pretty. So you know where I'm going to go next. If you have <laughs> the Chanticleer, flood our DM with your pictures, and we will give you a story. We want to make the whole week the Chanticleer story week on our storyboards on Instagram. They're a relatively unknown chicken that really deserves more attention. They yeah. sound wonderful. They do. They do. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens, and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well made and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so are we ready to move on to main topic? Yeah. 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 Okay, so it's about that time that we're going to go across the pond and have... Coffee with Fiona. Yeah. Yeah. I was miles out, wasn't I? I know I was. <laughs> hey, sweet friend. How are you doing this month? Oh, really well. I've really got to try and get that yeah in about um, <laughs> seconds before I know you're going to say it. That's the only way this is going to work. <laughs> the delay. It, it's, so, it's so difficult. Chrissy and I have tried to figure out the delay when we were just in two separate places here. We never got it. We never got yeah. it, ever. It was bad. It was really it bad. It was bad. <laughs> it was like, cut. It made, the, it made the edit floor. It was on the floor for the edit room. Like, you're done now. What we need to do is do it separately, and then you guys can edit it in one seamless move. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. <laughs> okay, you fair enough. <laughs> okay, so this month, we're going to, we welcome Fiona back. We're going to do a little broody report. And then we're going to do a little round table and we're going to talk a little bit about spring coop and run maintenance. Ooh, mm. that's the fun stuff. Mm. Mm. Okay. So let's start with the broody report. How's it going over there? Oh, it's tremendously well. So Taffy, as you know, she went broody very, very early. So she's now hatched and the youngsters are four weeks old now. Oh, wow. wow. And they are amazing. They are fantastic. There's one, there's one chick who is absolutely determined that I am its lift. So it will sit and wait for me to lift it up <laughs> and walk behind Taffy, holding her. Aww. And she is a little girl, so I may be keeping her. She's she's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I haven't watched her name yet. Yeah, yeah, they're all Orpingtons. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. So they're from our stock as well. She's actually got quite a lot. She's wow. done very well. Yeah, Good. we Good. actually hatched some of them though in an incubator and then we introduced them to her because if you have too many eggs 
under the orpington what can happen is as the chicks hatch the eggs can crush them because as soon as they oh. come out the egg you know how delicate they are yeah. yeah it can be a problem so the best thing that we do is if we've got more than 10 eggs we will keep some in an incubator hatch them separately because we've never had an issue reintroducing chicks to the orpington mothers but it has to be said if anyone else is thinking of doing that ours are very docile and ours are even more docile than most orpingtons as well so every chicken's different while we're talking about this, we do have some listeners with some questions about introducing baby chicks to broody moms. So do you have a few tips that we can give them? Well, we have not had any success with a broody hen who has not gone at least two weeks of brooding okay, and then had chicks introduced because if it's before that time, they kind of know that they're not past the point at where an egg should have hatched. So they're more likely to reject. But what we do is we wait until the the broody head mother is asleep. So we wait until nighttime. She's asleep. And then we basically pop one at a time under her wing and almost put their head towards her down. And naturally they'll burrow underneath. Because it's dark, as long as you don't have lights in it, if you can go in with, if you do need a light, take in a red light because it's less likely to disturb them. Okay. And then you can keep an eye on it. But then what we do is we close the coop up and we sit outside and wait for any noises at all. Just listen in very, very carefully. If you've got if you've got a coop cam or any way to watch them remotely, even better. And then be prepared to intervene if you need to. Always have a backup plan. Have a heat lamp or a brooder plate, something just in case you need to take them out. But the other thing, as I would say, is don't try and mix ages of chicks. Chicks really ought to be within two or three days of each other for the introduction as well. Cinnamon last year, now we did manage to introduce four cream leg bar chicks that were actually four days younger than the Orpingtons, which she had hatched. But Cinnamon was a very old broody for us. She'd done it many, many times before. Right. We knew how calm she was. We knew she was very solid and we knew she'd take them. So she was proven. If you're doing this with a brand new broody hen, anything could happen. And it's not just breeds. It is different for every single hen. So you just have to be prepared just in case. That was yeah. my one thing kind of scary is telling someone to put them in under at night because you have to, you, you can't go to bed. You have to sit there and listen and watch and make sure she's not instantly going to wake up and say, whoa, you don't belong <laughs> here and go after the baby. No, for the first half an hour, she's not going to, if nothing happens within the first half an hour, everything's going to be okay until dawn. Okay, so you don't yeah. need to worry about it because she will stay asleep. She'll either react almost straight away or you'll be okay till dawn. But I will always be up at the crack of dawn the next morning when I do this exercise and I'm out there doing exactly the same thing. That's just a 4am alarm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I wish the listeners could see my face at the moment. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I do. But then well, I'm you know, a crazy chicken lady like you guys. So. <laughs> and that is, the I mean, the most crucial time. Like if I'm doing an integration, that's always, I, I know the next morning I've got to be up at, at the crack of dawn because yeah. that's when it's going to happen. The sun comes up and they are face to face. And they're like, where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? We just integrated three new cockerels into the Nankim bachelor flock. And I will say it was the easiest integration I've ever had, bar none. Really? Wow. I think because they all look identical. And they're all guys. So they're like, hey, dude, welcome. Wow. Uh, we're going to watch them football, the throw the ball around. Yeah, even though they were younger. Wow. I got to tell you, though, when we let them out in the morning, it's hilarious. It's like a six-man dance off. <laughs> Everyone comes out and they're putting their moves on. It's so funny. <laughs> they're like, I'll dance for you. You dance for me. Right. For oh, you. come on. That's got to go on Instagram. I've really got to see that. Now. It probably should. I, I should. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You need to film that. It's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. To Sassy Night Fever soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> That'd That's be amazing. Perfect. But yeah. So the first couple of days I was up as soon as it got light, I was up and out because I was afraid of a big kerfluffle in the, in the boys house. Yeah. And it's, it's the same with the chicks as well, just keeping an eye on it. And actually then when it's chicks introduced to a broody hen, I'm always keeping an eye on, are the chicks keeping up with the brood hen during the day? Right. Is she showing them where food and water is? Because that's, that's the other thing to check as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
So on your end, everybody's good right now. Yeah, and Uno's gone. Uno's broody. Uno oh. has eggs. I know. Oh. My little my little hyperactive buddy is now sat on eggs. Oh. oh. Do you miss her? Because you're you're a hammer because she's on I the egg. I do. I do. So I'll sit on my little chairs in the in the garden underneath the cherry tree. I'll have the treats on my lap and she would always jump up on the other chair mm-hmm. onto the back of the chair and eat out my hand. And she doesn't do that now. Oh. She should meet she Gertie. Sat in a coop. Her and Gertie yeah. both like to steal chairs. Well, <laughs> I, I think would Gertie would walk all over it, to be fair. Oh, man, that girl is brutal. Woo! Talk about spicy. That's probably how you'll know when she's ready to make her chicks independent. When she's back up on the on the back of the chair, it's time. The chicks are on their own. Oh, no. As soon as she discovers the treats in the field again and she's out in the field, she will be uh- ignoring <laughs> the chicks. The chicks will be running around my feet. It won't be a problem. She'll be on the back of the chair. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's move into kind of spring maintenance because Rudy Hens gets us into the mood for springtime. And what are some of the things that you're doing over there for spring maintenance? Oh, full blast down on the coops. Everything is, this is the big opportunity for me because once the brood hen is in that coop and they've got the chicks, the ability to do a full clean down is really compromised because certainly for the three weeks while they're sat in there, I'm not doing anything and really probably for another three or four days after hatch as well because I'll keep them in until the chicks can keep up with broody hen and then they're out in the field. Then I can get in and do full clean down. Up until then, it's just, I can just get rid of any poo and not that broody hens ever poo in the coop anyway. Never. I love your um, video. Oh. <laughs> You've got your, your, your major big power washer. You're like, it's like a weapon. Like you're like, okay, I'm well, ready. Let's do this. Yeah. But that, that's the thing with the plastic hoops, you know, yep. with the Nesteras, it's, you know, the pressure washer is, it's just so easy. And I didn't do that on the wooden coops because I'll be taking off all of the exactly. protection. You can't do that with the wooden coops, but the Nesteras you can, and they're easy to take apart and put back together again. So, you know, it's a good process. So spring cleaning, power washing, or those plastic coops and the stairs are, it's a great time to do it. It's great yeah, time. I love my plastic coops. I, seriously, I love my plastic coops. There's so many good things about them. They might not look as pretty in your cottagey garden as a wooden coop, but oh, do they make life easier? You see, I disagree because they've, they've got that, um, the wagon, which looks like, you know, the kind of, what you call it, the pioneer wagons. Kind of stone. Um, or the Bardos, the gypsy caravans. Mm-hmm. And they're just... I mean, that's a statement coop. You know, if you've got that in your yard, everybody asks you about it. They really are a statement coop. There are very few wooden coops that look as unusual as that. So I I think, you know, there are those if you want one that looks pretty. You know, I really, really love one of those Nestero wagons from my duck house. Oh, yeah. They would absolutely love it. I mean, it really is. They would be a perfect duck house. I mean, the Uno's in ours at the moment brooding. Oh, (laughs) Yeah, it's her brood suite. She's got it all to herself. So oh, fancy. Uh, I, yeah, that honestly, is fancy. I highly recommend them. Actually, it's the chickens' favorite as well. The chickens want to be in there. I mean, if you remember last year, we had Marshmallow in there with her chicks. And then Licorice, who was in the ground coop, decided, hang on a minute, that one's better than mine. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and yeah, she went and joined Marshmallow in there. So yeah, move in. <laughs> yeah, and then I was having, when we took the wagon into our flock down enclosure over winter, when we had to keep them in the fully netted enclosure, and there was a few nights where I had to fight the egg layers because <laughs> they were in the coop down the other end of the flock down enclosure, and they wanted to be in the wagon as well. Yeah, so party in the wagon. It, it, it yeah. genuinely is the chicken's choice, I have to say. So, you know, you really got to get one. So after but- your power washing is done, what's something else? I know what I do a lot in the spring are take care of the roost. I take my contact paper, the old stuff off. I even use the power washer a little bit on the roost itself and clean them up, use some vinegar and water, and then put my contact paper back on and make it all new. Yeah, you see, I don't have that issue because none of our chickens, except for the three cream leg bars and one well summer, they're the only ones that perch. So actually, we've taken all the perches out of our coops. Oh, so I'm it's envious. not really an issue for me. I'm envious of that. Yeah, in my wooden coops, yeah. I still have to do the roost. Yeah. And my wooden coops are both my big layer flocks. 
Mine are a little different than yours. So yeah. I will scrub mine with the vinegar water solution mm-hmm. and then I sand them. Yeah, you can do yeah. that. And I'll even too take a really fine sanding paper and just go over them um, before. I, and then I put contact paper, really cute little contact paper on top. And then when it starts to wear off, then I'll just replace it. But this is what I do in the spring. Any kind of wood that's in there that they're going to be putting their feet on. Because if you don't, it can get bacteria on it. And think about sometimes it's the dirt from their feet is sitting on those roosts. And then it can cause a little bit of problems with bumblefoot. So it's a an ounce of prevention here. Equals a pound of cure. Yes. For sure. So you want to kind of get that going. And the spring's a good time to do it. Because the winter, it's cold. You don't want to be out there a long time. And the spring, it's great weather. So... I haven't used contact paper. I've actually used for the cream leg bars in the well summer. We've got off mill thick rubber. Nice. So it's yeah. rubber matting. And yeah. basically all I've done is underneath, I've actually just used a staple gun nice. to staple it underneath. And it stays in place beautifully. It's it's uh, tightly wound around there. So I'll just replace that in the spring. That's, That's what we've perfect. just done in that coop. Yeah. That's a good idea. The other thing, uh, and this is probably the only thing that's different. Other than like actual maintenance, this is probably the only thing that's different from what I do with my plastic coops. I will clean all the window screens and vents because mm-hmm. over the winter, they tend to get like a lot of feather and spider bander, webs, spider webs <laughs> yeah. on top of them. So I'll clean the vents really well. But other than that, you know, the wash down and then run maintenance. Oh, with my coops, I also, which is I'm going to have to do this year is paint. I have some coops, the wooden coops. I need to replace some of my doors and windows with another piece of wood, repaint it with the all weather paint, and then put it back on. Now I say this, that I'm going to do this, but this is going to be a Joe job. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, are you really doing it? Yeah. Well, you see, we do that over winter because we have a winter stock in the Nestera, the wooden coop, uh, sorry, the plastic coops. And the wooden coops, we do all of that maintenance in the workshop over winter and we just take a time on it. Yeah. So it's it's less of an issue for us. Do you guys use an insecticidal disinfectant at the end of your cleaning routine? I don't. Do. I just use vinegar and water. That's basically all I use. Yeah, the I mean the only time I've ever done that is when I had the one coop where the birds kept making nests and I kept ending up with poultry lice on my birds. Oh, right. Okay. And so that when I did, I dusted it with mm-hmm. seven dust, the old fashioned seven dust. That I think it's carbaryl. Right. Um, yeah. I use a, I use a liquid spray. I've used I, the spray too. Nice. Yeah. Either I do it every works. time when we do a deep clean. And I, okay. I probably don't need to cause there's no issues in there. Yeah. And by the time that now. I'm using it, I've already got all the spiders off. Mind you, there's usually only spiders' webs left because the chickens have eaten all the spiders. Yes. I know. I always tell those spiders, you know what? Don't go in there because you're not coming back out. And, and you do want those vents cleaned out because it's starting to get warm. Right. So you want the yeah. air to be able to come through freely. The thing I was going to say is I, with Joe doing some of the springtime maintenance, Mother's Day was last weekend. And on my card, Joe's part of his gift was supposed to be one day of chicken chores or two half days. But the way it's written by Sophia, it says one day or two and a half days. Oh, it's a trap. And and I said, he's like, oh, Sophia, how did you write this? You shouldn't have. I was like, oh, it's how it's written. I'm taking the two and a half (laughs) days. So it went from eight hours to 20 hours. Perfect. (laughs) And I was like, Perfect, because I need some wood painted. I need some wood cut. I need all the stuff. Just it's a amazing. minute. So, would he have got away with it if it hadn't been Mother's Day? Would he <laughs> been allowed not to do any chicken chops? No. <laughs> no. Well, that's not a proper gift. Then you still need something. Well, that's where the two and a half days come in. So, yeah, yeah. it would have been one day, but now it's two and a half. Thank you, Sophia, for not putting those parentheses. <laughs> Good girl. Yeah. Well done. Well done. She was laughing. He was like, oh, Sophia. But yeah, so that's the kind of stuff. And like you were saying, the runs, let's move into the runs. What should we be doing for the springtime in there? Because I am still dealing with heavy metal issues off and on, I lime my runs every spring. You do. To raise the pH. So that's going to be a big one for me. I'm liming the sheep fields too. Woohoo. We also, both in spring and fall, or I should say right before summer, right before winter, we also walk all of the runs and fields and check 
for weak spots that need to be reinforced, any place where the wire is rusted and we'd have to patch that. This is also yeah. the time of year that I add extra wood chips to the run, to surrounding the runs. You do that all year long. I do it all year round, <laughs> but it's a good thing to replenish all these things at a certain time and say, okay, it's spring, let's do it here and then let's do it this time. But replenishing your bedding in the runs, that's always a good thing to do. It gives nice even ground, nice new stuff. Planting flowers, that's a good springtime maintenance around your run. Flowers and herbs that are safe for chickens to eat. Right. I'm doing mint. <laughs> Why don't you see it in cleavers everywhere? Because we thought, <laughs> which is great because cleavers are a horrible weed, but they're just eating them like nobody's business. Well, so they're not getting any flowers from me because I want them to eat the cleavers. <laughs> well, I mean, if you have your poultry out on pasture, that's perfect. I mean, that I would which they are now. I mean, but to be fair, a run site where I mean, here in the UK, because flock down's gone, hours are back out free ranging. So for me, our run maintenance now is taking the flock down enclosure down, right? Mm -hmm. Flattening out the ground, digging out all the old wood chip. Oh, cutting down. All of the trees around them, we've just had major tree surgery done in the last week. Oh, wow. wow. Major. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. Honestly, it's gone from being a fully enclosed canopy over what was a flock down enclosure to light. It's beautiful. We've still got the wind protection for them, but there's so much light going to be in the new flock down enclosure. It's going to be wonderful. Now, the trees, did you chip them so that you'll have them to use again? Absolutely. We have got a wood chip mountain. It's yeah, quite a hill. It is literally, it's like Everest. It really is. You've That's got, wonderful. It's, I love this. It's a beautiful sight. I know mine's and pretty steaming. small right now. And yeah, it's and steaming. It's, yep. Yeah, it's steaming because the heat is generating. It's amazing. But before I can start leveling that out on the ground where the run is going to go back up, I've got to physically level the soil itself because this one bit, for whatever reason, it's... The, the soil must be about 18 inches higher than the shallowest bit. And it wasn't like that at the start of the season. I don't know what's happened. I don't know whether they've been digging and moved it into a great right. big hill. But, you know, I've got a lot of leveling up to do. And then with grazing in the springtime, do you have to do anything with the grass or the pastures where they're on? Or you just, this is the time you just let them eat the grass and everything we've got enough space that it's not a problem yes they're digging holes of course they're digging holes you can't have them on grass and them not digging holes but there's enough of it that we don't need to patch it it will just leave it alone until autumn and then we'll start patching it in autumn time so when we get to the height of summer and it gets very hot again they will destroy every blade of grass under their favorite shade tree the rest of it will be fine. The rest of the field will be absolutely fine. But under the one cherry tree that they love the shade from, there won't be one blade of grass. <laughs> I feel like the fall is the time to batten down the hatches and get ready for the cold winter when you're doing maintenance. Yeah. And the spring is the time to beautify and be like, okay, let's clean it all up. Let's get ready. It's spring. It's going to be summer here. Let's make it beautiful. Let's plant the flowers. Let's do all this stuff. I also just started pulling all of my coop heaters out, cleaning them and storing them so that we can get fans in. Yeah, that's the new thing for the spring, locating your fans and getting them ready, getting the extension cords, whatever you yeah. need so well, that you have fans ready to I go. I just bought more of those small battery yes. fans yep. with the fully enclosed blade. The ones I had last year were absolutely superb, so I've just got some more of those for this year. Aren't they mm -hmm. fantastic? They will pull the air right through the coop. I swear yeah. by them. Yeah. yeah. My big wooden coops, we have to have these gigantic fans that shoot the air at the ceiling so that it goes through the whole coop. But all of my plastic coops, no matter who makes them, all of my plastic coops, one of those battery powered fans in the windows, yeah. it's fantastic. Works really, really well. It really, really does. It is great. I'm just thankful we actually haven't had a need. I mean, we don't have the right breeds for coop heaters, but we also don't have a very cold climate either right. here in the UK for heaters either. So we haven't needed to do it. You never know, the weather may change. We might go back in time again and have colder weather. I hope you don't. So I, do I, I mean, 
The fans, I have them ready to go. Everybody laughs because I have so many box fans now. It's crazy. But they are ready to go because, you know, the big Orpies, all the big oh, girls, yeah. they yeah. need the fans in the summertime. They just don't like to, the heat. I mean, it really does affect them. Well, they ha- they can't disseminate the heat off of their bodies. Right. And they don't have, mm-hmm. say, the comb that an Andalusian does. Where, right. You know, that just gives off so much heat. And the Orpingtons and the Brahmas and Cochins and... All of the chickens that I have in my brooder right now (laughs) all require fans. (laughs) Yeah. You ought to try the Orpingtons brooding at the same time as having. Oh, I can't even imagine. We had not enough. I mean, we we have to add ice bottles in because to bring the temperature down even more to absorb some of that heat is the only way to help them. Yes. I'm sure. Well, that's what we do. There are so many nights here in the mid Atlantic where we go to close up and it's still 80 Fahrenheit. And so. And this was Pete's idea, and it's it's absolutely fantastic. We wrap ice blocks, like the frozen ones you use in, say, coolers, picnic coolers, yeah. things like that. We wrap them in towels and put them in the coops. And in an hour, the temperatures come way down because they're so well insulated. It works like a charm. That's another yeah. thing to put on spring cleaning and maintenance. Start getting those things out and frozen. Yeah. Because yeah. we don't make sure you have them. Do it, we do it a cheaper way, which is with two-liter pot bottles, just yes. filled Three quarter full with water, and then just have them in rotation in the freezer. Yeah, we, we have keep replacing. We do the but same. like you, we wrap them in old towels so that there's no direct contact with the chicken's body itself. We have the bottles as well. We just found that they, after a certain point, they degrade faster than the actual um, ice packs. But luckily, you all are not dealing with the nighttime temperatures that we do all summer long. No. It, it can be absolutely miserable. Yeah, yeah, so starting to find those things or save your two liter bottles and just being ready for the heat, that's part of the spring getting ready. Yeah. And I feel like it gets hot earlier. We don't have that much spring anymore. We go from... We've been lucky this year, though. It's been This, cool. this year has been very nice, but it usually goes from like late winter to summer really quickly. Yeah, I have yeah, a feeling we're going to have chilly spring and then hot. Could be. Yeah, I think we had the 40 degree temperature here last the Celsius, not Fahrenheit, clearly. And I think it was about June time um, Probably. last year. And it, it doesn't feel like it's, I mean, we're only sort of 15, 16 degrees Celsius here at the moment, mm-hmm. which is definitely cooler than last year. It's, it's pleasant. Cool it's spring. nice. Yeah, yeah, it's been cool here too. And I've actually enjoyed it. I like yeah. still yeah. needing a sweatshirt on in the morning. That was last year. So 40 degrees Celsius is 104 degrees Fahrenheit to put it into perspective. Yeah. Wow. That's really It hot. was horrible. And we had... Th- three broodies at that point in time oh, yeah God, so fine. And, uh, and you know with that 40 degree temperature was registered less than 10 miles away from where we live wow. oh, for heaven's sake. so it's true to where you were yeah it was and it was the temperature and you are seriously rural so it just makes you think how hot was it in town yeah probably super hot but well it was the highest temperature ever recorded in the uk so we had it worse <laughs> good heavens wow i know but it was an RAF base less than 10 miles away from us where it was actually recorded. So so you have yeah. a new video out that is all about how the power wash. I love it. Yeah, it's deep cleaning. It's how we deep clean our coops. But it's what we do for the spring cleaning routine, so getting ready for our booty hands. So essentially, in a nutshell, power wash. So power wash it to get rid of all the dust. We then scrub with just basic washing up liquid and warm water to get anything that's that's left over, power wash it again to rinse it. And then I use an insecticidal disinfectant just as a as a final go through. Are you power I probably don't need to do that. Maybe not, but never if hurts. you're gonna put broodies and chicks in there, you probably want to be extra careful. Yeah. Yeah. Are you power I don't, washing I don't want to inside are you power washing inside and outside? Yes. And that's why the, the plastic hoops, again, make it easier because it's, you can take the roofs off, you can take the side panels off. It's just an easy job. And actually, on those nesteros, being able to physically take the nest box off mm-hmm. makes it because the nest box is always the most awkward place to get at. Yeah. It's always really difficult to either get to the one side of the, the nest box. It's really, really difficult. And being able to physically take it out and scrub it down separately, it's just a life saber and drains um, in the bottom of the coop help with a oh lot God, i know i can't believe how much they've thought of but i mean for us the fact that you've got these great big sheets of plastic instead of the lapped wood over each other 
the chance of getting red mite, northern fowl mite, chicken lice, you know, anything that uses those crevices to hide in, it's minuscule, it's tiny. So I'm reluctant to put our broodies in the wooden coops now. I try and use all the plastic ones first because they're in there 23 hours out of 24. And I need them to be as healthy as possible because they do lose weight during the brood period. Oh, yeah. Right, right. They're far too yeah. important to me, bless them. So we'll have the video linked in the show notes showing you how to power wash. We want to thank Fiona for coming on again this month for our roundtable. We love our monthly roundtables with you. It's so fun to catch up. You're such a good I love it too. <laughs> thank you, Fiona, for coming on and talking with us. Thank you. See you next month. We'll see you next Bye. month. Bye. We just want to thank Fiona one more time for another great roundtable. We have so much fun talking to her. Remember that you can go view Fiona's videos on YouTube at English Country Life, and we'll have the video for her Coop Power Wash Oh yeah, linked in the show notes. Thanks, Thanks Fiona. Fiona. Okay, so let's move on to Cracking the Eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this week on Cracking the Eggs, we're doing... Strawberry cheesecake. Because it's that time of the year. Like everything should be strawberries in May and June mm-hmm. and July. It just, I don't know. I love, there's a farm near us that has a strawberry patch that when the kids were little, the girls, we would take them and we'd spend hours picking strawberries. Oh, yeah. This time of the year, it brings happy memories. And then I would come home with all these strawberries and then bake all this stuff and then put strawberries in the lunch every day. And then Joe would say, how many strawberries are we going to eat? Are we through these strawberries lot. yet? I mean, if you either have to eat them all or you have to make jam out of them or something like that. Or something. Or yeah. you can make a strawberry cheesecake. The strawberry cheesecake, i got to tell you, is really, really good. I'm a huge fan of any cheesecake. And then you put strawberry on it. I'm going to be a huge fan. And of course, we did include our gluten and dairy-free substitutions. This really is the perfect recipe for a spring party. Oh, yes. You know, if you're going someplace and you need a make and take, or if you're having some friends over for dinner. You want to talk chickens with your bestie, make the cake. Drink the coffee, eat the cake. It's great. Eat the cake. Now, you only need two eggs for the recipe, so you have plenty left over for your deviled eggs. You can still store your other 40 dozen from this time of exactly. the year. Exactly. fine. It's great. <laughs> this is essentially a creamy cheesecake base with a layer of delicious strawberry sauce on top, followed by whipped cream or dairy-free whipped cream. Does it get any better? Oh, no. It's good. Okay. So, we're going to go through. You're going to make your graham crust as you usually do. Yeah, there are three steps to the cheesecake, the crust, the main, the the cake itself, and then the strawberry sauce. There are detailed instructions in the recipes on our website. So we're just going to do the filling. Yeah, the main points right here. Right. So with the graham cracker crust, you can make it or buy it. No harm either way. Whatever you want to do. Now let's go into the filling and see what kind of ingredients we're going to need for this. It's not going to be too bad. We're going to need three eight ounce packages of cream cheese and they can be regular cream cheese or dairy free cream cheese, 24 ounce in total. And as with anything with baking with cream cheese, it needs to be a little soft to be able to work with. Yeah. My favorite brand for the dairy free is Tofuti. Let's go into how much sugar you're going to need. Two thirds of a cup of granulated sugar, a third of a cup of half and half or dairy free half and half, two eggs, like we said before teaspoon of vanilla, a teaspoon of lemon juice, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon, a pinch of sea salt, and two tablespoons of all-purpose flour or gluten-free in its equivalent. So let's go into toppings, and then we'll go into how to put this together. Yeah, the strawberry topping. You're going to make this, if you made the strawberry rhubarb compote, this is very similar, except it's got some cornstarch to give it some more stick-togetherness. Right. That pretty glossy. So You need a pound of fresh strawberries that you just picked at the farm. That would be great. Or that you bought at the Walmart. Whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. Hold and quartered. (laughs) A third cup of sugar. A tablespoon of lemon juice. Like Holly Ann said, a teaspoon of cornstarch. And then a teaspoon of vanilla. So you're going to use a springform pan for this. Nine inch is ideal. Wrap the bottom of it in foil because this cheesecake needs to be baked in a water bath. Okay. For maximum creaminess. You're going to preheat your oven to 350. You're going to do your crust, again, instructions for that on our website. You're going to use a stand mixer or a large mixing bowl. You're going to add your cream cheese. You're going to mix that until it's light and creamy. Add the sugar, mix it some more. You're going to add the half and half. Blend that until it's pretty well blended. You're going to scrape down the sides. You're going to add the eggs one at a time. Mix until it's completely combined. It can take a little while to get the eggs into all the cream cheese. I love making cheesecakes. Oh, it's so fun. You're going to add 
your vanilla, lemon juice, cinnamon, salt, and flour, and beat all that just until combined. My oldest sister, Colleen, I made her wedding cakes. Yeah. They were cheesecakes with white chocolate frosting. That's nice. Yeah, they were good. I love cheesecakes. And somebody- It is one of my absolute favorite desserts. Some people don't, they think it's hard. They're not hard to make, especially, they're not no, the, hard. I mean, the water bath makes it slightly fussy, but literally all you do is take like a jelly roll pan or a baking dish, wrap the bottom of the spring form so the water doesn't get into it, mm-hmm. put it in there in the oven, and then just pour- you know, you pour a glass, you can use a glass of water. Right. Pour a glass in there until the water comes up the sides of it. It's yeah. that easy. It's not hard to do. No. Pour the filling in the crust, put the pan in a rim baking sheet, a jelly roll pan, any other kind of rimmed baking dish. Just like you said, it's easy. Yeah. Fill it up until the water comes about an inch up the sides. You're going to bake it for 30 minutes at 350. Then you lower the oven temperature to 275, bake it for another 40 or 45 minutes. Right. Turn the oven off and leave the cheesecake in there to cool. Once you take the cheesecake out, you'll put it in the fridge. You need to chill it for a full 24 hours yes. again to keep that consistency where if you not, need it. If not, you're going to have just mush. Yeah. Cheesecake has to be baked the right way yes. and chilled the right way. Exactly. And then the strawberry topping, making that's really similar to the strawberry rhubarb compote if you yes. need that. You're just going to stir the strawberries and sugar together in a saucepan in a little bowl, a small bowl. Right. Add that lemon juice, vanilla, and cornstarch. You whisk that until it's smooth and there are no lumps remaining. Because if there are lumps, you're just going to cook it into a lump of lump. cooked cornstarch. Yep. Pour that stuff over the strawberries in the pan, stir it together, cook it over medium-high heat until it comes to a boil. You're going to stir it frequently, keep the ingredients moving. Once it boils, reduce the heat to medium-low and cook it until the berries are breaking down and the sauce has thickened and reduced a bit. Exactly. That can take 10 minutes, yeah, 12 minutes, depending on how high your heat is. Then you're going to set it aside and let it cool. Once the cheesecake is chilled for 24 hours, you can assemble. Just release the pan from the bottom since it's in a spring form pan. I love releasing those. Those I are know. so cool. It's that's like fun. that's like it's so fine. It's like, okay, it's time. Boom. And then you can see the sides of the crust and the yeah. cheesecake. And you can see the layers. So you can add the strawberry topping, and then you're gonna spread or pipe a layer of whipped cream on the top and serve it with a cup of coffee and you're good to go. That's an amazing spring dessert. So it good. Is. Take it to your spring party. Take it to, you know, there's a lot of graduation parties this time oh, of year. Oh, it'll be a good graduation cake. Yeah, maybe you could bring it to the graduation party. <laughs> I could. I mean, Sophia <laughs> has has requested a large chocolate cake, but I could sneak in a cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so try it. Let us know. Send us pictures. If you like it, we'll give you a story over on Instagram. So I hope you enjoy it. It's going to be yummy. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy retail therapy yeah Yeah. okay this week's retail therapy we went to something that was kind of fun and different Mm -hmm. so we're talking about garden channels for your chickens yeah it's fun it's fun yeah yeah so you would not even believe it the places that you can get these channels there's so many you can even go onto amazon and buy pieces for the channel right together so we have a couple places to tell you where you can get the channels we also have A link to Country Living Magazine because they have a really good article on DIY channels Mm -hmm. and they have links to a couple of videos and pictorials. Yeah. So yeah. we'll have that for the DIYers. Some it's it's very therapeutic to sit there and watch these chickens walking through these channels. It's pretty neat, yeah. And if you put them through a garden and then they can t- put their head out and chomp on the garden, that's better than watching TV. Or really, you could probably use them to send your flock to a garden bed that you need turned over. Yeah, because they had on the one website I was on, they had like a big flat part that you could put like over the garden. So like a big enclosed space at the end of the channel yes, can for open the garden. out with a garden bed inside of it. Right. Yeah. So that's where they are. And then they kind of channel through. It's kind of cool. It's better than TV. So we have the DIYers covered. Tell us a couple of the places where you found ready-made channels. Okay. So I found Chicken Condos. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is a big website. And I looked on there. It's a little bit more pricey on there, but it's already put together for you. Yeah. Basically, you're kind of just putting them in the ground, and then connecting some of the pieces. Okay. So they range from, you have corner brackets anywhere from $38 to uh, 12 by 16 by 96 larger outdoor channel for $130. Mm-hmm. So this is something that you could start short 
and right. kind of build on yeah. also. It doesn't have to be super long because right it's modular. Away. Yeah. It's modular. And they also had like the flat pieces that you could, the standalone pieces mm-hmm. that you could just put down and let them walk through those also. Okay. Amazon has them. How about that? Yeah. Prime delivery? Prime delivery. <laughs> so you just go right on Amazon and, you know, there's different channels there. Different price points. Different price points, different pieces. And if you Google Chicken Channel, all these different places come up. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just fun to see what comes up, where you can find the pieces, how, if you want to build your own, how you want to do it, mm-hmm. different outlines or different kind of configurations configurations on how you can put these together and some if you're going to get them already done they're going to cost a little bit more they're going to be expensive right just know that but if you just buy the material and you do it yourself there's a lot of videos out there on doing it yourself Mm -hmm. it might be a fun thing to do with your family and then sit back have a nice beverage and watch the chickens walk through it eat your cheesecake eat your cheesecake and have a little cocktail and watch them. Glass of dessert wine. <laughs> I'm planning this already. I know. It's great. <laughs> it's great. Okay. So let us know if you like the channel idea or if you have a channel, send us some pictures. We'd love to see it. That might be one of our projects that we do soon. Maybe. Yeah. That'll be fun. It'll be fun. Okay. So we need to tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week. Next week, we have a fantastic American breed, the Buckeye. Yay. You really don't want to miss, but they have a great story. Main topic. We are talking about Rynek and our other mini topic, we are talking about the new antibiotic law that's going into effect on the federal level. What you need to know. Cracking the eggs, we're doing a savory layered omelet crepe cake. It's going to be so It looks good. amazing. And retail therapy, we are talking, there's been some confusion about this. So mm-hmm. we're going to do a retail therapy and straighten it out. We're talking about powder to liquid foods. That you're going to need in your first aid kit for first aid medical care for your chickens. It's going to be a don't mess. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening. Ha, 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 ha.